This is Leonard Peikoff speaking in the fall of 1990. The following lecture is part of a course originally given in 1976 with Ayn Rand's endorsement and in her presence. As of 1991, however, the course will be superseded by my book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. My book recapitulates the 1976 course, but its formulations and logical structure are immeasurably superior. Despite this fact, I am making the original course available for purchase for several reasons. Students may find it profitable to compare the course to the book and discover for themselves the differences. Also, the 1976 course is the only recorded statement of the entire content of objectivism. My new taped course on objectivism is selective, taking for granted a knowledge of the philosophy. Finally, Ayn Rand herself took part in most of the question periods in 1976, and I do not want her recorded comments to disappear from the objectivist scene. To all of you now about to hear this lecture, however, let me stress at the outset that I myself speaking some 15 years later, regard my new book and not this course as the definitive statement of objectivism. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There is no question more crucial to man than the question, what is man? What kind of being is he? What are his essential attributes? In the history of thought, many philosophers and artists have claimed to answer these questions, to look at man and to report on his nature. Their reports have clashed through the ages. Aristotle, for instance, defined man as the rational animal. Plato in the medieval looked at man and reported that they saw a drooling hunk of flesh encasing a soul yearning for supernatural salvation. Shakespeare, in his plays, presented man as an aspiring but foolish mortal, inevitably defeated by a tragic flaw. Immanuel Kant saw a blind, duty-ridden chunk of unreality, in permanent hawk to the unknowable. Victor Hugo saw a self-confident, purposeful valuer, undercut by a malevolent universe. Hegel saw a half-real fragment of the state. John Dewey saw a ward healer chasing the expediency of the moment. Freud looked at man and claimed to see an excrement-dripping pervert itching to rape his mother. Ayn Rand looked at man, at man, not men, and saw the possibility of Howard Rourke and John Galt. What kinds of philosophic questions did Miss Rand and all the others I mentioned have to answer in order to define their view of man? Is man a rational being? And if so, what does this mean? What is reason? Is man an autonomous entity who functions and survives as an individual? Or does his survival depend upon erasing his individuality and merging into a group? Is man an integrated being of mind and body? Or is there a clash, a dichotomy between these two elements? Does man possess any irrational elements? By his nature now, I mean such as, for instance, mystic insight, or inexplicable instincts, or an indefinable, quote, creative spark, or a supernatural conscience? And if the answer is there are no inherent anti-rational elements, then what about emotions? Is man a puppet, shaped, moved, defeated, by forces beyond his control, by God or society or his genes, etc., Or is he the shaper and master of his own destiny? Is philosophy a luxury or is it a necessity to man by his nature? And if so, 
what is it necessary for being of mind and body? Or is there a clash, a dichotomy between these two elements? Does man possess any irrational elements? By his nature now, I mean, such as, for instance, mystic insight, or inexplicable instincts, or an indefinable, quote, creative spark, or a supernatural conscience? And if the answer is there are no inherent anti-rational elements, then what about emotions? Is man a puppet, shaped, moved, defeated by forces beyond his control, by God or society or his genes, etc.? Or is he the shaper and master of his own destiny? Is philosophy a luxury, or is it a necessity to man by his nature? And if so, what is it necessary for? Such are the kind of questions subsumed under the heading of tonight's lecture, the first in this course on the philosophy of Ayn Rand, man's metaphysical nature. Now, metaphysics, as I'm sure you know, is the branch of philosophy that studies the nature of the universe as a whole. It's the branch of philosophy which studies existence or studies reality. And metaphysical means pertaining to existence or pertaining to reality. When we speak of man's metaphysical nature, we mean his essential enduring attributes, including, above all, his basic relation to reality. In other words, those fundamental attributes which every human being has in every era and country by the very nature of a human being. Now, this is a metaphysical, not an evaluative subject. We are not here this evening to make value judgments. We're not here to say what is good for man or evil, what he should or should not do. We are concerned now with a factual question. What in fact, is the essence of human nature. All value judgments presuppose and follow from a view of man's metaphysical nature. Without such a view, whether it's conscious or subconscious, explicit or implicit, but without such a view, no one can enter the fields of ethics or politics or aesthetics or practical decision-making of any kind. Until you know in some terms what you are, you cannot know whether you should be selfish or just or free, whether you should get a job and pay your debts or go on welfare, whether you should admire America or Russia, George Washington or George McGovern, whether you should send your children to a progressive or a Montessori school, whether for emotional refueling you should contemplate the statues of Michelangelo and the Greeks or the modern collages made of dirt and bus transfers. <laughs> All these and 10,000 other ethical, practical, aesthetic issues are derivatives. Their root is the nature of man. The issue of man's nature, however, is not the base of philosophy. It is not a primary. And you can see this yourself if you consider the many contradictory views of man's nature that have been put forward through the ages and that I touched on at the outset. The reason for these differences is that one's view of man depends on more fundamental questions. It depends on one's view of the nature of reality as such, that's metaphysics as I've just defined it, and it depends on one's view of man's means of knowledge. That, of course, is epistemology. I won't insult you by spelling it, it's on the brochure anyway. 
that is the branch of philosophy which studies the nature and means of human knowledge. In this regard, you can think of the issue of man's nature as the center of any philosophy, the center in a literal sense. At the base and start of philosophy are metaphysics and epistemology. As a consequence and expression of this foundation, one reaches a view of the nature of man. Then, as an expression and implementation of this view, one reaches answers to the evaluative questions, the questions of ethics, <coughs> politics, aesthetics. Ethics, of course, is the branch of philosophy which defines a code of values to guide human choices and actions. Politics is the branch of philosophy which studies the nature and the proper functions of government. Aesthetics is the branch of philosophy concerned with the nature and proper standards of art. Now, if you see the place of man's nature in an organized systematic philosophy, you will see that all philosophic roads either lead to the nature of man or they lead from it. If philosophy is likened to a 50-story skyscraper, this is obviously just an analogy, then I would say that the first 25 stories at least are pure metaphysics and epistemology. Then for several floors comes the first major cashing in, the center, the metaphysical nature of man. And then comes the top 20 odd floors, the value branches of philosophy. So we are not starting at the beginning tonight in our study of objectivism. We are starting right in the middle of the structure. My reason for such a procedure is this. Nothing, not even its ethics, reveals the essence of any philosophy more eloquently than its view of man. If we have the objectivist view of man before us at the outset, that will serve as a beacon and guide to us for the rest of the course. Thereafter, we have a shining goal that we want first to reach and validate, and then to implement and apply practically. So after this evening, we will go back to the foundation and study the issues on which the objectivist view of man rests. That will be lectures two through six. And then we will consider the evaluative consequences and implications of what we discussed this evening, and that will be lectures 7 through 12. By this method, we don't plunge into the more abstract aspects of philosophy until you see clearly, by your own judgment, that those technical questions are of life and death importance because everything including your own understanding of man, and therefore yourself and your life, rests on them. Now, before we turn to our subject this evening, which is what is man according to the objectivist philosophy, there are a few preliminary remarks I want to make about the nature and content of this course. To begin with these lectures, and I think this point, the outline of subjects on the brochure makes clear. These lectures presuppose a certain knowledge of the objectivist philosophy. I'm taking it for granted that in a general way you are familiar with the leading ideas of objectivism. In a sense, my presentation is self-contained in that I do cover all the essentials of objectivism. And for each point that I introduce, I define the terms, explain how the issue arises, and offer the validation. Or at least, I indicate where you can look it up. So in that sense, the course could theoretically be followed by someone who had no previous knowledge. But the pace and the emphasis would be extremely difficult for such a person. There is too much, too many different points in any given lecture for such a newcomer to be able to digest or retain. 
and, in addition, my emphasis often stresses points and topics that could be of interest only to a person who is already at home, on a certain level at least, with the basic objectivist viewpoint. My purpose in this course is to present, in essential terms, the entire theoretical structure of objectivism. Its central principles in every branch of philosophy, their interrelations, their application, their validation. In particular, I propose, and I ask you, to be highly conscious about the issue of methodology. Be sure you know the proof, the validation, of each central point that we make. And of course, it's my business to present these proofs. By the end of the course, you should be able, for every principle, theory, conclusion of objectivism, you should be able to state, this is what it says, and this is how I know it. This is its basis in reality. This is its validation. If you can do that, you will really have learned objectivism, and I might add philosophy even more broadly. If you cannot do that, the entire course is a useless endeavor. I will say more by way of propaganda on this point <laughs> at the end this evening. However, I must point out that in our discussion tonight, I cannot give you Ms. Rand's full proof of all the points I cover, because tonight we are deliberately starting in the center. On each issue this evening, therefore, I will take the argument up to a certain point. And then I will remind you, here we raise fundamental question such and such, which we'll discuss, and then I'll name the lecture that we'll discuss it in. And I suggest, if you want, keep a list in the nature of an agenda, or from another perspective, a promissory note, which I have to guarantee to make good on. And I hope by this method to let you see for yourself how much of the basic metaphysics and epistemology you take for granted and count on when you consider the sort of questions that we deal with tonight and thereby give you a personal reason for caring when next time we start to plunge into the very more abstract issues. Now finally, before we start formally on the content of objectivism, I want to identify one point clearly at the outset. The philosophy of objectivism from metaphysics through aesthetics is the creation and achievement entirely of Ayn Rand. Not infrequently, there will be points or examples in the lectures which I have learned from Miss Rand in private philosophic conversations. I've been fortunate enough to hold such conversations with Miss Rand across the period of about 25 years now. And I have taken and kept notes on these conversations throughout that period. And many of these points do not appear in Miss Rand's writings. They are, however, her discoveries. All right, now, what is man according to the objectivist philosophy? The first thing to say is that he is a living entity, a living being of a specific nature, a specific identity. And as such, he has, like every living organism, a specific means of survival, a means inherent in his nature. What is man's means of survival? Well, how will we answer this question? By the only method that there is for answering philosophic or any other questions, by looking to the facts of reality. In order to sustain and protect his life, man requires food, clothing, shelter, tools, medicine, and countless other objects which are not given to him automatically by reality which do not simply drop into his lap in answer to a wish, a hope, a law, or a prayer. He requires a vast spectrum of values, which he can obtain only by his own action. 
Now all living beings must act. As such, this point is not distinctive to man. The lower species, however, act automatically to pursue the values their life requires. In the case of animals, they act by the direct guidance of sensory experience, of percepts. Man, however, does not have the capacity of automatic action, in contrast, for instance, to a plant. And he cannot survive as animals do by the guidance of mere percepts. Quote, a sensation of hunger, I'm quoting Ms. Rand, a sensation of hunger will tell him that he needs food if he has learned to identify it as hunger. But it will not tell him how to obtain his food, and it will not tell him what food is good for him or poisonous." Unquote. The same pattern applies to all the values man's life requires. The lower species find the values their life requires ready-made in reality. They simply adjust themselves to the given. They appropriate the values they need directly from nature and consume them or they use force against other organisms. Man, however, is not equipped to survive in a contest of brute force with the animals. And the values his life requires are not ready-made. Wheat, shirts, apartments, hammers, penicillin, and all the rest do not sit preformed and waiting in reality for man to seize them. Paraphrasing Galt, the goods are not here. They must be created by man. <coughs> they must be produced. What enables man to produce? How is he to discover what to produce? And by what means to produce it? How is he to discover what materials reality offers him? What their potentialities are? What laws govern their behavior? What techniques and methods will enable him to reshape them? into the sustenance of human survival. How in some is man to discover what goals he should pursue, what values his life requires, what actions will achieve them, what actions will threaten and destroy his life. He needs a commodity indispensable to his survival, knowledge. Not merely the kind of knowledge the animals have, not merely percepts, that acquaint him with the immediately given, but the kind of knowledge that can integrate the past and plan for the future, the kind of knowledge that will enable him to reshape his environment by productive action to meet the requirements of human survival. He needs <coughs> conceptual knowledge. He needs to engage in a process of thought. He counts above all, therefore, on the faculty which forms concepts and performs the process of thought. The name of this faculty is reason, which in Ayn Rand's definition is the faculty which identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses." Unquote. Life requires the achievement of values. I'm summarizing now. Life requires the achievement of values, which requires action, which in man's case means above all production, which requires conceptual guidance and direction, which means the exercise of reason. Reason is man's distinctive means of knowledge. It is his only means of dealing with reality and guiding his action. As such, reason is man's basic means of survival. Now, this is the first crucial tenet of the objectivist view of man's metaphysical nature. <clears throat> this is the fundamental tenet of which all the rest of tonight's points are elaborations or consequences. Man is the rational being. By which I mean not that he necessarily always uses the faculty of reason, but that he is the being who possesses the faculty, and above all, the being who survives by its use, by the use of reason. I quote here from Galt's speech, the key paragraph on this point. 
quote, man's mind is his basic tool of survival. Life is given to him, survival is not. His body is given to him, its sustenance is not. His mind is given to him, its content is not. To remain alive, he must act, and before he can act, he must know the nature and purpose of his action. He cannot obtain his food without a knowledge of food and of the way to obtain it. He cannot dig a ditch or build a cyclotron without a knowledge of his aim and of the means to achieve it. To remain alive, he must think." Unquote. The role of reason in human survival is a metaphysical fact, and as such, evidence of it is to be found in every era of human history. History in this respect is like a huge philosophic laboratory in which the expressions of philosophic principles are written in capital letters and italics for everyone to see if they trouble to look. In regard to the role of reason in human survival, you can read these letters wherever you look. You can see, for instance, the nightmare poverty, the starvation, the backbreaking labor, the sweet, sweeping plagues of that era of anti-reason, the dark and middle ages. You can see that as late as the 17th century, when the West had already begun to enter the modern world, life expectancy in many Western European areas was under 25 years. You can see that as late as the 18th century, before the Industrial Revolution, Nine out of ten working Americans had to work full time on the production and distribution of food, whereas today an enormously greater quality and quantity of food is produced and distributed by only one out of five working Americans, leaving 80 percent of the labor force free to produce the undreamed of unimaginable wealth and prosperity and safety and life expectancy that the West enjoys today, since the culmination of modern science, the Industrial Revolution. And against that, you can see how men endure and suffer and still to this day die in hordes, not only in war but in peacetime as the norm and the to be expected, die from starvation and disease in the non-industrialized, non-scientific, non-rational rest of the world. From the simplest necessity of man to the highest abstraction, quote, from the wheel to the skyscraper, this is Howard Rourke speaking, everything we are and everything we have comes from a single attribute of man, the function of his reasoning mind. Unquote. Well, if you call reason as man's means of survival point one, then you can call the next point point two, if you want, and find a value in numbering. It's merely an elaboration of what we've said so far. And this is, reason is an attribute of the individual. There is no collective mind and no collective brain. <clears throat> A process of thought is a private, enormously complex process, which must be initiated and directed at every step by the decision and judgment of the thinker. It's a process of perceiving facts, making connections, grasping abstractions, integrating new data, defining one's terms, drawing conclusions, all of which can be done only by an individual. Just as Rourke observes, you cannot digest food for another man or breathe for him, so you cannot think for or through another man. Men can and do learn from others, and this is a crucial element in human progress. But to learn from others means to understand their conclusions by grasping the reasons for them which can be done only by the exercise of the learner's own mind. Men do build on the achievements of their predecessors, and this is crucial to human progress. But what we receive from others, as Rourke says, quote, is only the end product of their thinking. The moving force 
is the creative faculty, which takes this product as material, uses it, and originates the next step. This creative faculty cannot be given or received, shared or borrowed. It belongs to single individual men." Unquote. In a division of labor society, men gain enormous advantages from the work of others. And they can achieve feats by concerted, joint effort that no man could achieve by himself on a desert island. But this does not mean that the thought or even the work involved is literally collective. In any joint undertaking, each man must do his own thinking to guide his own part of the labor. If he is to contribute to the final result, anything other than mindless muscle power. And in any joint undertaking, someone's thought must define the nature and goals of the undertaking and integrate its components. No work, as Rourke says, is ever done collectively by majority decision. Every creative job is achieved under the guidance of a single individual thought." Unquote. If you want an idea what a collective thought process would consist of, or the nearest that a man could get to this literally impossible idea, it would have to be a process where each man in a group tentatively puts forth a half-formed half-idea and quickly withdraws it if the others don't take it up. In other words, where no man puts forth any firm, definite idea of his own to which he is committed, where none tries to convince the others of his view, where each shrinks from independent self-assertion or intellectual responsibility and waits for the others to decide something, the others who are engaged in the same abstention the same empty, timorous waiting, and the result is a committee meeting. <laughs> Such as the board of directors meeting of Taggart Transcontinental and Atlas Shrugged. That scene is not a caricature of collective thought. It is the perfect, archetypical example of it. Except, as you see, it is not collective thought that it dramatizes, but non-thought. Now, I don't have to give this audience examples on a historical or social scale of the individualistic nature of thought. If you have read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, you understand the role <coughs> of the great creators and innovators in human history, and why and how their achievements, on which all our lives rest, are the product of that delicate process which occurs only in a private mind and brain. Man is an entity. He thinks as an individual. He survives as an individual. The collectivists, from Plato to Hegel to the present, are wrong. Wrong metaphysically, not just morally or politically, but metaphysically. The fragment of the group that they talk about does not exist. Only man exists. And if someone tells you that man survives only by means of society, you have to ask him, well, what then is society's means of survival? And you will quickly see that the only answer is the power of thought, the only kind of thought which exists, individual thought. Now, our discussion tonight, let me remind you, is metaphysical, not ethical. I am not now saying man should be intellectually independent. I won't say that for going on two months. <laughs> I'm making a different, a related, but a different point. I'm saying as a matter of fact, as a fact of reality, thought, man's tool of survival, is a private, individual process. Now, to help you see the metaphysical nature of this point, I want to remind you that there are certain living species, for instance, ants, who are built differently from man, who have a different metaphysical nature in regard to the present issue, who
who are not equipped to survive as individuals. Uh, the creatures I have in mind are, you could say, an embodiment of Plato's philosophy. <laughs> Each is built in such a way that it can perform only one of the functions that its survival requires. Such creatures are metaphysically components of the group, wedded to the collective by nature. By itself, each such ant is incapable of survival. So if you were a philosopher for ants, collectivism would be the truth. <laughs> but man is not an ant, or a coral bush, or a Hegelian fragment of society. Man survives by reason. Of course, he gains inestimable advantages from living in society, if it's a rational society. But the point is, metaphysically, he is capable of independent survival. And the crucial requirement of his survival, whether he is alone or in society, is a private process of thought. And I might add, not only can man survive alone, he can survive much better and longer on a desert island with all of its disadvantages and problems than in a society which is irrational and statist. Man, as seen by Plato or Hegel, requires a collectivist dictator to suppress and rule the individual. But man, in fact, cannot survive under such conditions. By his metaphysical nature, he is a rational and therefore an autonomous being. Now let's stop here for a second for station identification. I mean methodological identification. Everything that I've said so far rests on the premise that reason is man's distinctive means of knowledge and therefore his only means of dealing with reality. What subject covers the topic of man's means of knowledge? Epistemology. When one says that reason is man's means of knowledge, does that need validation and detailed explanation? Does it raise complex, critical questions that urgently require an answer? Yes, dozens and dozens of such questions the wrong answer to any one of which invalidates reason and wipes out everything I've said tonight. What are these questions and what are the answers? Tune in for the next five weeks. All right, let's now turn to another allied issue in regard to man's nature, and you can call this number three if you wish, the relation of mind and body. Now, I want you to observe that in discussing the role of knowledge in man's life, I have not said or implied that knowledge is an end in itself, or that it's for the sake of cocktail party or professorial chit-chat, or that it is disinterested. I've said the opposite, that knowledge is necessary for the sake of dealing with reality, of production, of preserving and safeguarding man's life. I've said, in other words, that the function of reason is, in essence, to be a guide to action, that reason is indispensable in the practice of living, that it is a practical faculty. Now, this approach to reason is distinctive to objectivism. Everyone, to be sure, grasps it in some form and to some extent. But prior to Ayn Rand, no one, and no philosopher, not even Aristotle, grasped or accepted this point fully. What stopped previous philosophers from grasping it is a crucial error that all of them in various forms and degrees succumbed to, an error concerning the metaphysical relation of man's mind and body, an error that in full-blown form has the effect of making thought useless and action mindless, an error called the mind-body dichotomy or the soul-body dichotomy. 
Now, this dichotomy declares <coughs> that mind and body are two opposite, antagonistic elements in human nature, inherently at war or in conflict with each other, and that man therefore must choose between them. He can cast his lot with the mind or soul, in which case he must disdain and reject the body, or vice versa. He can endorse the body and its claims, in which case he must reject the mind. On this view, you see, among many other things, knowledge being intellectual is divorced from physical action and practice and must be pursued, if at all, as some kind of spiritual end in itself. Now objectivism denies and throws out the mind-body dichotomy completely as a matter of principle and in every one of its countless forms. Why? What is the objectivist view of the metaphysical relation of mind and body? First, there is no ineffable mystical soul. This is S-O-U-L. If we use the term soul, and it's perfectly OK, we use it to designate an aspect of man's consciousness. Similarly, the term mind designates an aspect of consciousness. It designates the conceptual faculty. And consciousness, according to objectivists, consciousness as such now, whether animal or human, is a part of nature. It is a fact of reality. It is an attribute possessed under specific conditions by certain living organisms. It is not unnatural or supernatural. It is a natural faculty. And its function is not to attune us to a mystical dimension, but to perceive physical reality. This reality, the world of nature revealed by our senses. Human consciousness, therefore, is this worldly in its essence and function as this worldly as the human body. And when the two elements are united, that constitutes a single indivisible entity, man. Man, according to Ayn Rand, is an integrated being made of two attributes, consciousness and matter, or mind and body. The function of the mind is to acquire knowledge and define values. The function of the body in this context is to carry out or enact the conclusions and value judgments of man's mind. Each of these attributes is indispensable to the other and to the total entity, which is man. Without a mind, man has no means of knowledge and no way to direct his actions or preserve his life. Apart from its internal vital processes, the body does not and cannot function automatically. It does not move by an explicable urge or drive or mystic instinct. A human being, and an animal too for that matter, moves and acts only under the guidance of his consciousness. If a man loses consciousness, his body becomes inert. On the other hand, without a physical brain and body, man can have no consciousness or ideas at all, let alone any way of carrying out his ideas in action. The two elements are two indivisible aspects of one harmonious, integrated entity. That's the objectivist view. Now consider the mind-body dichotomy. Without the centuries of profound historical corruption behind us, the idea of a clash between the mental and the physical would never occur, at least not to an ordinary, decent person. <laughs> the idea of such a clash is literally senseless and unintelligible if taken literally. What would you think if someone said to you that he was a metaphysical battleground, that there was a bitter war being waged in his person between two clashing elements, his faculty of vision versus his toes? <laughs> or his knees or his pancreas, his eyesight versus his legs. 
Now, if you even deign to speak to such an individual, <laughs> you would say that his idea is fantastic. How can perception clash with a physical organ? What could such a clash consist of? Does his eyesight keep turning to President Ford while his legs keep running on their own after Carter? <laughs> or what? Now, in fact, you would say the truth is the reverse of this claim. The eyes see, and the man uses his legs to walk to or around or away from what he sees. The one yields awareness, the other is guided by that awareness. The metaphysical relationship is harmony, union, integration, not conflict, clash, war. Now the same is true more broadly of the relation between mind and body as such. The one is a source of knowledge, the other translates the knowledge into action. Both attributes are indispensable to man, <coughs> both are indispensable to human life. Quote, a body without a soul is a corpse, that's God. A soul without a body is a ghost, unquote. And both of these ghost and corpse, he notes, are symbols of death. Now, if a man accepted the traditional dichotomy literally and attempted conscientiously to act on it, he would find himself in an impossible position. Suppose he decided to cast his lot with the mind and reject matter and physical action of any kind. What are his choices? Well, you might think he could spend his time daydreaming. But no, he could not daydream about what he or others could or should do, because action is out. Well, you say he might be religious. But no, he couldn't even utter a prayer to God, which is a physical action. And by the way, it's an action which certain ancient sects proscribed. They regarded praying as sinful as a means of sullying their spiritual religion with materialistic elements. Well, this purely spiritual man, you might say, could be a fraudulent hypocrite. Well, maybe, so long as he simply spun theories in his mind without reference to physical reality and stayed in bed if he could find a non-material bed. <laughs> or he could be a schizophrenic out of contact altogether with physical reality, and in a catatonic trance, immobile and waxy flexible. That he could be, so long as some low-grade materialist was around to feed and bathe him. Now, on the other hand, if a man rejected thought and the mind, literally and fully, and decided to cast his lot with matter and action, with mindless, physical action. What are his choices? He could be a sleepwalker, but no, he can't count on any previous knowledge or any subliminal awareness to guide his movements. Well, could he be a plain brute? Well, there'd have to be somebody to tell him whom to beat up and how to do it. But again, he could be a psychotic, this time of the manic variety out of contact with reality and flailing around grotesquely and insanely. Now, these patterns are as close as a man could come to pure thought or pure action. Pure thought is non-thought because it means it has no reference to physical reality. Pure action is non-action. It is simply purposeless movement. Both patterns enacted fully mean suicide. The same principle applies to the relation of theory and practice. A theory in this context, in this context is any conceptual identification of the facts of reality or of guidelines to govern human action. Practice, action is impossible without such an identification. In other words, without knowledge of some kind. And in turn, theory is senseless without reference to material reality and pointless 
without reference to action and practice. The idea that something can be good in theory but not work in practice is a bad theory which does not work in practice. <laughs> a good theory means a true theory, one which recognizes all the relevant facts of reality and integrates them into a non-contradictory whole. Such a theory has to work in practice if you act on it appropriately, because that means your action is guided by reality at every point. It takes account of every relevant fact. It is consistent with every such fact. It is in harmony with reality. In other words, it works. What gives the theory-practice dichotomy any shred of plausibility to the average man? The advocates of the dichotomy put forward some bad theory, some theory that they wish was true, even though it blatantly isn't. And then they, well, you see, I have a great theory here, but it doesn't work. It's as though I were to say I have a terrific new theory. Let's fly airplanes without fuel. Think of the money we'll save. <laughs> And then I applied this theory. I see a holocaust of plane crashes, mangled bodies. I shrug and I say, <clears throat> so much for the mind. My idea was good in theory, but for some mysterious reason, theory doesn't work in practice. Of course, the mysterious reason is that the theory is wrong, is false. The same applies to every so-called good theory that doesn't work in practice. It doesn't work, assuming it's been appropriately applied, because it is not good in theory. It overlooks facts. It contradicts reality. It substitutes an error or an arbitrary wish for the truth. This is especially obvious in the case of moral and political theories, such as the idea that self-sacrifice or communism is good in theory but not practical. They surely are not practical, because they are fundamentally anti-reality, anti-reason theories, as we'll discuss in several months. Now, if you ask me, well, but how do I know when a theory is true, when it's non-contradictory, when it corresponds to reality, the answer is, that is epistemology. That comes later. Now, how did a disastrous error of such dimensions as the mind-body dichotomy ever arise? <clears throat> how did it win the allegiance of so many millions of men? It stems from two closely allied schools of philosophy, both of which go all the way back to ancient Greece and right up to the present. Their standard names in philosophy texts are the idealists and the materialists. Both of these terms, by the way, are used in a technical sense. The idealists are those who, in metaphysics, advocate consciousness without existence, and in the case of man, claim that he has a mind <coughs> without a body. The body, they say, or matter as such, is either an illusion which isn't real at all or it is a half-real manifestation of something spiritual. In any case, it's low, evil, and to be shunned. That's the idealists. The materialists are those who advocate existence without consciousness and, in regard to man, claim that he has a body without a mind. The mind, they say, is either an illusion, which doesn't exist, or it's a useless byproduct of brain or nervous system motion. Examples of the first school are people like Plato, Augustine, Kant, Hegel. Of the second, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher Democritus, Thomas Hobbes, Karl Marx, Skinner, and his brood. Ayn Rand has a better name for these two schools, a more informative name. She calls them the mystics of spirit and the mystics of muscle. Now, why mystics? 
a mystic is anybody who claims that knowledge is possible to man by means other than the senses or reason. Well, the idealists, the mystics of spirit, reject the physical senses. Knowledge of reality, they claim, comes not from sense perception, but from the supernatural or the ineffable, from revelations or faith or a sixth sense or innate ideas, etc. The materialists, the mystics of muscle, avowedly reject the faculty of reason. Man, they claim, is a chunk of flesh and bone, a mindless chunk, whose conclusions reflect the blind workings of glandular squirtings, or atomic dances, or SR conditionings, or that weird waltz-like contortion known as the dialectic process, etc. Now, speaking of the soul-body dichotomy, Galt says, quote, <clears throat> do you observe what human faculty that doctrine was designed to ignore? <clears throat> it was man's mind that had to be negated in order to make him fall apart. Once he surrendered reason, he was left at the mercy of two monsters whom he could not fathom or control, of a body moved by unaccountable instincts, and of a soul moved by mystic revelations. He was left as the passively ravaged victim of a battle between a robot and a dictaphone." Unquote. And then one sentence from Galt to Dagny in the Valley, quote, the defenders of man's soul were concerned with his feelings, and the defenders of man's body were concerned with his stomach, but both were united against his mind." Unquote. Now observe that the mind-body dichotomy is not a primary. Both types of mystics derive their view of man from their fundamental philosophy, the same kind of fundamental philosophy, from the same metaphysics and the same epistemology. In metaphysics, both start by denying reality. I mean this reality, the reality man perceives. The traditional idealists do so in the name of God or a supernatural dimension, to which they go on to say the soul really belongs. The simplest example of the materialists in this context is the modern communists, who reject reality in the name of an alleged dimension which is the opposite of everything we know about the world and man and life, and which they call the future. A future, as Miss Rand observes, which consists of denying the present. Now, what is the actual truth on all these issues? What is the nature of reality? Is it mind? Is it matter? Is it both? What? And what are its laws? Well, this is one set of questions we must answer if we are to validate the objectivist view of the mind-body question. And these questions form part of metaphysics, our subject next time. Now look at epistemology for a moment. In epistemology, <coughs> both of these schools, the idealist and the materialist, reach their conclusion by denying reason, as we've seen. And both, note this, both subscribe to the theory-practice dichotomy. They have to, given their epistemology. Theory, they all say. And this is true even of those materialists who claim not to believe in any super world. Theory, they say, pertains to one world and practice to another opposite or conflicting world. And that's why a good theory does not have to work in practice. Theories, they say, pertain, well, for instance, to a world of floating abstractions. That's Plato or to a world of sensations that have nothing to do with physical objects. That's the Greek sophists. Or a subjective world created by and existing only in man's mind. That's Kant. Or a world of linguistic manipulations or dialectic contradictions or collective feelings, etc. That's sundry moderns. Whereas action, practice, occurs in this world which is the opposite of the world that theory studies. <clears throat> and therefore, they say, something can be good in theory but not work in practice, 
and therefore the mind-body dichotomy is true. Now what is wrong with all this? What is wrong with all these views of reason and the mind? Is knowledge objective? What is the relation between theory and the world, between abstractions and concretes, between language and physical objects, between sensations and physical objects, between logic and knowledge, between reason and reality? Here again you see a whole set of urgent questions, this time from epistemology, on which the objectivist view of the mind-body question depends absolutely, and which we will have to consider for several weeks to come. As to ethics and the value branches of philosophy, I will merely note in passing here that both schools, the idealists and the materialists, characteristically preach sacrifice, whether to God or society, and both preach man's impotence on earth and his inevitable suffering and defeat. The mystics of spirit, of course, promise happiness in heaven. The mystics of muscle, in the communist version, promise happiness in the future, to your great-grandchildren, as Galt puts it. Now, this kind of conclusion is unavoidable to both schools, because neither a man without a mind nor a man without a body can exist, can function, can achieve values, can live. If he tries to approximate this bifurcated condition, he is, to that exact extent, he is metaphysically doomed to suffering, defeat, impotence. Now, when I was first preparing this lecture, I wanted at this point to quote you a few passages from one of the most eloquent, eloquent expressions that I know of, the right view on the mind-body question. And that is the sequence in Atlas Shrugged which presents the first run of the John Galt line. That sequence is magnificent on many counts, but I was focusing on it as the perfect artistic and philosophic expression of the integration of mind and body. It represents such an integration because it unites the deepest intellectual issues with the most breathtaking action. And philosophically, it is explicitly concerned with the issue of the relation of mind and body. I'm sorry to say, however, that I found that I could not quote only a few passages. The sequence is so integrated that every paragraph I selected necessitated just one more, <laughs> until I found I was quoting the entire thing, which I would love to do, but time makes impossible. But I do urge you to go home and reread that sequence. Reread it specifically in the light of the mind-body issue. It will give you an image of the objectivist view of man and man's life in the context of the present topic, a radiant image that only art, great art, can achieve or approach. Now, there are countless forms of the mind-body dichotomy prevalent today. <coughs> many, many more than the few that I have discussed tonight. Some of them we are going to discuss in future lectures, some we will not get to at all in this course. But for your information, so that you can get an idea of the enormous ramifications of this error, here is a typical partial list of dichotomies, all flowing from the same fundamental mind-body split all resting ultimately on the same sort of false metaphysics and epistemology that I indicated to you. And in every one of these cases, note, a person can choose either side of it. He can choose the alleged soul side and turn against the body one or vice versa. Now, this is just a for instance. There's ideas versus money. One side saying that ideas are important but inefficacious in life while money, a mindless product, is the vulgar power that rules the world. That's many of today's intellectuals. The other side saying that ideas are spiritual and cultured and all that, but they're a waste of time and the thing to do is to say to hell with philosophy, theory, ideas, and achieve security by simply amassing physical goods. That is many businessmen, unfortunately. 
There is an allied dichotomy, the Platonists versus the pragmatists. One saying truth, with a kind of reverent tremble around that word, <laughs> truth is an end in itself not to be degraded by physical objects or action. And the other, the pragmatists, that action is what count, counts action unrelated to concepts or principles, which are some kind of old-fashioned, unnecessary spiritual hangover. There is love versus sex, the witch doctor type versus the Attila type, happiness versus pleasure, pure science versus applied science, woman versus man, and that one I have heard both ways, <laughs> with the woman as the spiritual and man as the low and materialistic, or the woman as the physical and man as the sublime and spiritual. Both are wrong. <clears throat> There's art versus business, politics versus economics, morality versus science, rationalism versus empiricism, concepts versus percepts. In art, there is profundity versus entertainment, and on and on. Both sides relying on the same false alternative, the same fundamental soul-body dichotomy, with both factions, in each case, being wrong. Now, some of these, as I say, we will discuss later in the appropriate context. The point now is simply that the ramifications of this issue alone could fill an entire course by themselves. And you have to be on the lookout for any smell, any faint odor of the soul-body dichotomy. Now there is one further manifestation of the dichotomy that I must, however, discuss now, because there are widespread confusions in regard to it, and it is critical to a proper view of man's metaphysical nature. I mean, and you can call this point four if you're keeping score, <clears throat> I mean the relation of the mind and the so-called heart, or more formally, of reason and emotions. Now, this subject has been distorted, perhaps more than any other, by the soul-body dichotomy. And it's been distorted in every imaginable form and variant. Plato, for instance, who represents one widespread view, Plato held that the mind is a spiritual, exalted faculty, and that emotions are worldly, animalistic, materialistic, and therefore they should be shunned or repressed. The Sophists, as a group of Greek skeptics contemporaneous with Plato, agreed with Plato in essence, but they opted for the emotions, preached whim worship, and rejected the mind as a myth. On the other hand, many of the medievals <coughs> and of the 19th century German philosophers held what seems on the face of it the completely opposite view. Emotions, feelings they held, are the spiritual element in man. They are exalted, supernatural, cognitive powers which lead man to true reality, in their view of it, whereas reason or the mind, they said, is an earthbound faculty cut off from true reality, limited to vulgar physical sense perceptions. In other words, mind is spiritual and emotions are physical, or emotions are spiritual and mind is materialistic. You can have the dichotomy either way. The common denominator is the dichotomy, and the conclusion, man cannot live exclusively by reason. That's the conclusion drawn by these people from it. He, man can't live exclusively by reason, they say, because he has emotions. And emotions are an inherently non-rational element that has to be reckoned with separately. Or to put their view another way, the central premise shared by every variant on this issue is emotions are an independent phenomenon. In other words, independent of a man's thoughts, ideas, premises independent of the mind, 
And whether the people then go on to say that emotions are good or bad, high or low, physical or spiritual, products of chemistry or God, or utterly inexplicable doesn't make any difference. Now this premise that emotions are independent of the mind is wrong. It's false. Both mind and emotions have physical and conscious elements or conditions. The mind is not, quote, purely spiritual. It requires, as we've seen, a brain and body in order to exist, and its primary task is the study of physical reality on the basis of physical sense data. And emotions are not, quote, purely physical. They are conscious states or experiences with bodily accompaniments and, above all, with spiritual, intellectual causes. This last point, indeed, is how one distinguishes a pure physical sensation from an emotion. A sensation can be transmitted by purely physical means and will be experienced in the appropriate circumstances regardless of the person's ideas or premises. If you touch a man in the right place with a red-hot poker, he will have a certain sensation from strictly physical causes, regardless of whether he is an objectivist or a communist. But emotions, as against sensations, are not merely a product of physical stimuli. Fundamentally, they depend on and come from something in the mind. They are products of the conceptual faculty. How? What exactly do they come from? And why, if emotions are a product of the mind, do there appear to be conflicts sometimes between a man's thoughts and his feelings? These are the questions we want now to consider. But first, let's take a break for about 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now pick up the subject of emotions. The first thing to stress is that emotions, love, fear, desire, hatred, happiness, suffering, anger, joy, etc., emotions are not irreducible primaries. They are not just there, inexplicably popping up out of the blue. They have causes, definite, definable causes, intellectual causes. Now let's develop this point systematically. An emotion is a response to an existent or object of some sort which one perceives, such as a man, an event, a situation, etc. The object, however, the thing you perceive, whatever it is, has no power by itself to invoke a feeling or emotion in you. It can do so only if you supply the necessary conditions, the link between the perceived object and the feeling. That link consists of two distinguishable intellectual elements. First, you must know in some terms what the object is that you're perceiving. You must have some kind of understanding or identification of it, true or false, but some kind. Otherwise, to you, the object is a cognitive blank. It's a zero. You have no idea what it is, and you cannot react to it. And second, you must evaluate the object, the situation, the event, whatever. You must appraise it. You must pass a value judgment on it. In other words, you must conclude in some terms that it's good or bad, desirable or undesirable, for your values or against them. You don't have to evaluate it explicitly to have an emotion. The value judgments in question may be explicit or implicit, conscious or subconscious, rational or contradictory, sharply defined or vague and blurred, clearly known to you or buried, hidden, unidentified. But in some terms, you must appraise the object in accordance with your values in whatever form you hold your values. If you do not, then the object, even if you have an idea what it is, would be an evaluative blank or zero to you. 
it would be meaningless to you, one way or the other. You wouldn't see it as good or bad for you or against you, so it becomes a matter of indifference, and you can't react to it emotionally. To respond emotionally, you need, one, an identification of the object, true or false, but enough to constitute an idea in some terms of what it is. And two, an appraisal of the object that you have thus identified in terms of your value judgments. Now here is an example that I constructed illustrating the operation of these two factors. It is obviously a schematic, but I think helpful example. Six men say, look through a microscope at a series of medical slides, cross sections of various tissue. One is a savage fresh from the jungle. <laughs> to him, the procession of eerie moving shapes, shadows, and colors, which is all that he can make of it, suggests, say, something undreamed of and inexplicable, some mysterious, ominous expression of a supernatural dimension and he feels, say, a twinge of dread. A second man is an ordinary, civilized layman who knows that the slides are something safe and scientific, but who has no idea what they stand for or mean and merely yawns. A third man is a painter, a representational painter. He, too, has no medical knowledge, but he focuses on, say, a particular combination of intersecting lines and blobs, and he may think how hideous. It reminds me of Kandinsky. <laughs> <coughs> and he feels a touch of aesthetic revulsion. <laughs> then St. Augustine looks at the slides. <laughs> and he understands only, say, this is one of the products of that pagan, irreligious science everyone is talking about. And he feels antipathy and even anger and outrage that he's in the presence of blasphemy, of what he calls the lust of the eyes. <laughs> then a doctor looks at the slides, and he feels profound sorrow. <clears throat> They're the slides of tissue taken from a close friend of his, and they mean he understands a fatal disease. And finally, an ivory tower researcher looks at the slides. He spent his life looking for a particular type of growth to prove a certain medical theory culmination of his life's work. He sees the growth on the slides. He feels an overpowering emotion of elation. Now here we have the same object, perceived by men of the same species, and depending on their conceptual context, in other words, on their knowledge or idea of what it is, and above all, on their value judgments. They feel superstitious dread or yawning indifference, or aesthetic revulsion, or religious condemnation, or painful depression, or joyous exaltation. Now, what caused these emotional states? The slides? The physical object by itself? No. The slides as identified and evaluated by each of them in the context of his own ideas and value judgments. The slides as grasped and appraised in some terms by a mind. Now, when I present the issue of emotions in class to ordinary kids, in the sense of not students of objectivism, my standard procedure at this point, having given only this much theory, is without warning or explanation of any kind, suddenly to reach into the desk, take out a pile of examination booklets, and start distributing them to the students. <laughs> of course, consternation breaks out immediately, and the class is gripped with terror. <clears throat> and there are cries that you never said we were having an exam today, and it isn't fair, etc. At that point, I stop, take back the exams, and I ask them, how many of you can explain the emotion which just swept over you? <laughs> Is it an inexplicable primary, a quirk of your body, a message from God, a jostling of your glands or your id? 
And obviously, the answer is clear to them, and a shower of hands goes up. Do booklets mean an exam? An exam to most of them means failure. <laughs> Now, there was losing their A in the course, wrecking their transcript. It's bad news. <laughs> and on this one example, they grasp quickly enough that emotions do have causes, and the causes are what one thinks, one's knowledge and value judgments, the conclusions of one's conceptual faculty. And I may point out as added confirmation, there are auditors in most classes. That is, people who are just sitting in and don't take exams or get grades. They invariably remain calm during this experiment, <laughs> which I point out to the class. To the auditors, the exam is not a threat, so there's no negative value judgment involved. Now, if the cause of emotions is so obvious that freshmen can grasp it without difficulty, <laughs> why is it that the vast majority of men have failed to grasp the cause? <clears throat> well, there are many reasons. But one key reason lies in the very nature of the emotional process itself. If we break it down, there are four steps involved in an emotion. Perception, identification, evaluation, emotional response. Of these steps, only two, the first and the last, perception and emotional response, are normally conscious and easily graspable. The two middle steps, identification and evaluation, are provided in essence by the subconscious and occur automatically without the need of conscious awareness and with lightning-like instantaneous rapidity. As an adult, once you have acquired a whole vocabulary of conceptual knowledge, you automatize it just as you automatize your knowledge of spelling or typing, etc. You don't have to reason consciously and deliberately to know, for instance, that something is an examination booklet. The application of the relevant concept is automatic and unhesitating. It's the application of past knowledge stored in your subconscious. And similarly, once you have formed a set of value judgments, you automatize them. You don't have to reason consciously or deliberately to decide that you value a friend's life or a good grade or whatever. You know it, and you apply that judgment immediately, instantaneously. Your value judgments, like your past knowledge, are present in your subconscious, which is a store of the mental contents you have already acquired but which are not in your conscious awareness at a given time. The subconscious automatically integrates, applies your knowledge and your value judgments to the new object you encounter in all these obvious kinds of cases. It does so without the need of a conscious, deliberate thought process. And the result is, it seems to many people that we simply perceive and then feel with nothing intervening. The truth is, a whole chain of ideas and value judgments intervenes, but it is automatized, so most people are unaware of its presence and role. The subconscious, as Ms. Rand has observed, functions in this respect like a computer, a complex computer, which you program by means of your ideas and value judgments. But once it has been programmed, it feeds its printouts, emotions, automatically to you in response to the objects you perceive. And it prints them out so fast that most people regard the results as primaries, forgetting that the mechanism is empty until you program it, until you fill it with the content of ideas and value judgments. Now, there's a further important point to make here with regard to the role of the mind in producing emotions. Value judgments cannot be formed in a vacuum. Just as in formal philosophy we said, you cannot reach value questions until you first answered the questions of metaphysics and epistemology. 
Well, the same is true in essence in the case of an individual, even a non-philosophical one. As an adult, he cannot form or hold value judgments except on the basis of some sort of fundamental view of life. In other words, of himself, of other men, of the world. This is the base on which every man forms his specific value judgments and preferences and goals. This is the base which conditions the kinds of value judgments he will form, and therefore the kind of things that will attract or repel him, the kind of emotions he will feel. If a man on this fundamental level holds, usually implicitly, if he holds that he's a helpless nothing, that men are inexplicable brutes out to destroy him, that the universe is unintelligible and malevolent, well, that sort of fundamental mental set or philosophy will affect and condition every aspect of his value judgments in every realm. And the objectivist literature makes this point very clear, I think. That kind of mental set or philosophy will affect his ambition, the kind of work, if any, that he's drawn to, his preferences in friends, art, parties, etc. In all these areas and countless others, this sort of man will have radically different sorts of values and therefore radically different preferences, likes, dislikes, desires than a man, for instance, of self-esteem who holds that his mind is competent, that man is a rational being, that the universe is an open, benevolent realm where achievement and fulfillment are possible. Philosophy, fundamental philosophic issues such as these, are only implicit for most men, not explicit. Yet such philosophic issues are the base of a psychology. They are the fundamental programming of a man's subconscious computer, and hence they shape and influence all of his particular values, and therefore all of his particular emotions. Now you see, just from this brief indication, the complexity involved. An emotion, says Ms. Rand, quote, is experienced as an immediate primary but in fact, but is in fact a complex derivative sum, unquote. An emotion is a derivative of value judgments and a vast cognitive context, all of it resting ultimately on an abstract philosophic base, and most or all of this material at any given time stored and automatized in your subconscious ready for a lightning-like application to the relevant objects as and when you perceive and focus on them. Now let's turn to the traditional non-objectivist view of emotions and consider how its philosophic advocates defend their viewpoint. There is a venerable argument offered by thinkers from Plato to Freud. It is the single argument offered in history, allegedly to prove that emotions are independent of the mind. I mean the so-called argument from conflict, which was first stated by Plato and has never been improved on since that time. <clears throat> How, he asked, can you explain the many cases where his mind tells a man one thing and yet his emotions do not respond? They pull in the opposite direction. It seems obvious, Plato said, that over and above the mind, we have in effect a beast in us. That's what he regarded it as, an independent, autonomous beast salivating blindly, urging us on to things that rationally and intellectually we condemn. How else, he asked, could you explain the frequent clashes between reason and emotion? The actual answer to Plato's question lies not in any beast, but in the fact that man can, and most men do, 
hold contradictory ideas, and that men have the power to remain unaware of their contradictions. A man can hold ideas and values subconsciously or implicitly, without identifying the fact. Ideas and values which contradict his professed beliefs. When he then responds to some object in terms of such subconscious mental contents, he may declare that his emotions didn't follow his ideas. In fact, they did. Only he did not identify his ideas accurately. For instance, a simple example. A young man stalks his subconscious across years with positive value judgments in regard, say, to the field of art. He's not too articulate. He's not too observant about his mental processes, however. So most of this content is only implicit, unidentified, fragmentary, unknown to him. Then in pattern, I'm obviously cutting out a few decades here, but his father tells him one day, you should be a lawyer. That's practical. You'll make a big success, etc. And the boy says, that's true. I agree, but I don't feel it. I want to go into art, and I have no idea why. Now, this is an obvious case in pattern where the person doesn't know his own conclusions. He doesn't know his actual values. So he thinks that there is some kind of inherent clash between mind and feelings. Or another example, a man accepts philosophically the premise that one must speak up for one's ideas and fight for them in the appropriate public forums. And yet he finds that he feels a great emotional reluctance to do it. He feels cowardice, which he cannot explain. And so he has a painful and to him mysterious conflict. Now, what kind of unidentified premises could underlie this sort of problem, this kind of cowardice? Well, in pattern, what we call social metaphysics, or the second-handers psychology, including the implicit idea that it's crucial to be liked and approved of by others and not to provoke trouble or antagonism. Now, if you hold this sort of idea, that, of course, will produce an emotional response completely at variance with the conscious premise and policy of speaking up. And if a man does not know his subconscious premises, he will be helplessly baffled at the conflict. The fact is one always responds on the basis of ideas of some kind. Emotions are not, by their nature, inexplicable demons though they become that if you hold contradictions and do not identify your ideas explicitly. The truth is that a clash between thought and emotions, literally speaking, does not and cannot exist. Such a clash, in fact, is always at root a clash of intellectual content, an ideational clash, a clash of ideas in whatever form they're held. The key line from Galt here is, quote, an emotion that clashes with your reason, an emotion that you cannot explain or control, is only the carcass of that stale thinking which you forbade your mind to revise, unquote. Now, why did this point elude Plato and his heirs through the centuries? Well, there are several factors that may be involved here. But there is one I want to mention, <clears throat> an issue which by itself is enough to account for Plato's interpretation and for the hold it has had on men throughout the ages, a purely philosophic issue. And I mean Plato's metaphysics and epistemology. If you hold with Plato that there are two conflicting worlds, a true spiritual reality and an imperfect physical dimension. And you hold that the mind studies truth in the higher reality, while life 
and action and desire pertain to this world, if you hold that kind of philosophic dualism and then you turn to man and observe conflicts between mind and emotions, well, then the explanation seems obvious to you. Conflict in man, you say, is simply an expression of the metaphysical law. The universe is a conflict of two opposing realms, and therefore it's only to be expected that man, the microcosm, should reflect that conflict, that he should be torn in two parts, with one urging him to the higher spiritual things and the other pulling him down to the muck. Plato's metaphysics, in short, and the epistemology associated and its equivalents during the centuries of medieval religion thereafter, and then of modern philosophy. All of it has established a basic philosophic framework in men's minds. Even in many men who profess to reject and despise Plato, a framework which makes them natural to fall into the trap of regarding emotions as inherently at war with reason. So again, we reach the same conclusion. Without the right metaphysics and epistemology, you cannot have the right view of man. And until you validate the right metaphysics and epistemology, until you prove it, you cannot fully validate or prove the right view of man, including the right view of the relation of reason and emotions. Now, in concluding the topic of emotions, I want to stress that our concern with the topic this evening and throughout this course is philosophical. There are a great many interesting questions of a psychological nature that one could discuss about emotions. But that is psychology, and therefore outside the province of a philosophic course such as this one. For philosophy, we need to know only one essential fact, which will not be affected by any discovery or technicality in psychology. It is a fact established by philosophic observation of man in conjunction with the appropriate metaphysics and epistemology. The fact that emotions are not independent, self-assertive entities, but derivative consequences of ideational content. That's it. That's the point as far as philosophy is concerned. In future lectures, we'll be discussing many philosophic ramifications and applications of this fact. Under epistemology, for instance, we'll be stressing that emotions are not tools of cognition, and that they are no hindrance or obstacle to the practice of complete objectivity. In ethics, we'd be stressing such points as that emotions are not proper guides to action, that man must live, value, and act exclusively by reason, and that man is capable of such complete, full-time, unbreached rationality. For now, however, I want to turn to and just touch on one particular topic. You can call this number five tonight. It's going to be briefer than the preceding, and it's our, well, I guess second last one, which is, this topic is closely connected to the issue of emotions, and it bears directly on the issue of man's metaphysical nature. I mean the issue is man metaphysically the pawn of factors outside of his control, or is man the master of his own destiny? In other words, the issue that goes in philosophy under the name of determinism versus free will. Now, determinism <coughs> is the theory that everything that happens, including every thought, feeling, and action of every man, is necessitated necessitated by previous factors, and they in turn by previous factors, and so on and so on all the way back, so that nothing in the past or present could ever have happened differently from the way it did. And everything in the future is already preset and inevitable. That's the doctrine of determinism. 
each man's life on this view is entirely a product of factors outside of his control. And therefore, the most consistent determinists add no man can be held responsible for his actions. Whatever he does, he has to do, period. It makes no sense to blame or praise him for anything. As against this, the theory of free will holds in broad terms that man has the power of choice or volition, that he is an independent, autonomous being in this sense. He's not a puppet of destiny. He's a being who can be held responsible for his choices and for the actions which flow from them. Now, on this issue, as I'm sure you know, objectivism advocates the free will theory in a very specific form. And we will be devoting parts of several future lectures to that subject. For the moment, I want to comment briefly on determinism. Like the theory of free will, determinism has been advocated in many different forms in the history of thought. Man, determinists have said, is the product of God's plan, or of conditioned reflexes, or of his id, or of his tools of production, or you name it. What all these varying interpretations of determinism agree on is one point, that man is determined. In other words, that he's a product of factors outside of his power to alter or control. Now, the average man today tends, as a rule, to be contradictory on this issue, to swing between determinism and free will. At certain times and in certain moods, most people incline to the idea that they are a free agent, the author of their own actions. At other times and moods, the same people will endorse the view that man is helpless and determined. Why people incline to free will is clear enough. Since it's the truth, there is abundant evidence of it in anyone's own field of introspective observation. But why do people also incline to determinism? It is not just the bombardment of deterministic theories in philosophic history. There is also something else, something that rings a bell to a great many people, that makes them feel when they hear deterministic claims, yes, that's plausible. I do feel helpless, out of control, moved by forces I can do nothing about. What forces? Well, mo many people would answer emotions. And that is the connection I just mentioned between the issue of emotions and of determinism. Most people who accept determinism whether all of the time or only on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Do so largely because when they look at their own selves and lives, they see that they are out of control. And they are so in significant part because they cannot explain or account for their own feelings and desires. It seems to them that their emotions are inexplicable entities foisted on them by some power they cannot fathom or control, and therefore that they're not masters of their actions or destiny, but to that extent they feel like puppets pulled by strings, moved by urges, passions, hatreds, loves, pleasures that come they know not from where. In a word, the view that emotions are independent of the mind and therefore that one is a helpless pawn moved by uncontrollable forces, this is one of the most potent weapons of the determinists in gaining confidence. Now we will discuss the errors of the doctrine of determinism as a general philosophic doctrine in a later lecture, I believe it's number three. For this evening, I want merely to look for a minute at two common popular versions of determinism. That is the heredity version and the environment version. And I want to look at them from the aspect of the role of one's view of emotions in leading one to accept or reject the determinist viewpoint. And the first one I'll look at says that man is a product of heredity. It comes in a variety of forms. 
man is born with certain genes or glands or physiological structures, etc. Some sort of innate factors like these which determine everything essential about a man. That's what I'm calling the heredity view. And the other common version is the view that man is a product of his environment that he may be born without any innate factors shaping his character, but that his character is the product of society, of social condition. Now notice that both of these versions have an element in common over and above determinism. Both in their commonly accepted forms fail to recognize the role of ideas in the generation of emotions. The heredity school treats emotions as a product of inherited physiological structures and processes. In other words, it treats emotions as the product of physical factors, not of thoughts or ideas. Your basic emotional makeup, these people say, your essential character is innate and physically or physiologically created. Now, if you understand the objectivist view on this question, you would drop this school right away. Because you'd say, if there were to be an innate emotional makeup or inborn inherited feelings, that would have to mean innate ideas, innate value judgments, innate concepts. And there are no innate ideas, so this one is out. Parenthetically, how do you know there are no innate ideas? That's epistemology. That's lecture three. <laughs> now the environmental school. <clears throat> it too, in its commonest popular version, treats emotions as independent of the mind. It regards emotions as the product not of innate physiological factors, but in effect of sensations or percepts. How, according to the environmentalists, here I'm using the word to mean the determinists, not the ecologists. That's a different type of corruption we'll discuss later. <laughs> How, according to the environmentalists, does society get to you? By what means does it shape and mold your character? Well, most of these people recognize that man has only one primary means of contact with the external world, including, therefore, with society, which is sense perception. So as they construe the process, you see people, you watch their actions, you hear their pronouncements. This goes on for many years. And after a repeated bombardment of such sensory data, the result is you build up certain emotional patterns and a certain character, which they say is the product of society. Now, what element did this school leave out? Again, ideas. Objects, statements, people do not reach directly or literally into anyone's mind. People cannot force you to accept a conclusion against your own judgment without your voluntary agreement and sanction. They cannot implant concepts in your brain by surgery. You have no choice about perceiving people, including hearing their statements. But perceptions, as we know, do not invoke emotions, <clears throat> only perceptions as interpreted and evaluated. Who does this interpreting and evaluating? Who forms the relevant ideas? Who does the thinking here? <clears throat> Not society, which cannot think for you. Remember the point that the mind is an attribute of the individual. You form ideas, your ideas, and you are the only one who can. And that means you are the source of your emotions, your conclusions. Not society, not the environment, but your mind. So the social version of determinism, in its commonest form, is also out. Now, as against determinism in all its versions, whether the heredity and environment school or any other, objectivism says the following. And here I'll give you just a summary in general terms. Man is born without innate ideas, and when he reaches the conceptual level, he is the sovereign. It is his choice to exercise his mind or not, to think or not, 
And that choice, which he has to remake at every moment and in every issue, that choice affects and controls the conclusions he comes to, the ideas he accepts, the value judgments he forms, and therefore the actions he takes and the emotions he feels. And this means everything essential to you as a formed individual, your character, your personality, your passions, the typical ways you respond to situations, your characteristic reactions, preferences, desires, ambitions, your recurrent patterns of action, all of it comes ultimately from your ideas, from the ideas you reached by the volitional exercise of your own mind. So if we use the term soul to mean your mind and its basic values, then in the words of Galt, quote, this is a very crucial line, as man is a being of self-made wealth, so he is a being of self-made soul, unquote. In this sense, according to objectivism, every man, man metaphysically, is an independent, autonomous entity, an entity who creates his own character. And this is one cardinal reason why objectivism views man, speaking metaphysically now, views man as an efficacious being, a being who can achieve his values here on Earth and can achieve happiness and fulfillment. There are many reasons underlying this conclusion, but this is one of them. This kind of efficacy requires as one condition that man be in control of his own person, his own character and mind of his inner world, otherwise is a helpless puppet, unintelligible to himself, ruled by a mindless destiny. And therefore, this is one root of Ayn Rand's benevolent universe viewpoint. We will pursue this at a later discussion when we get to happiness, which I think is lecture eight. Now, have I proved to you that man is a being of self-made soul? No, not yet. I've shown you only this much. If emotions are products of thought, and if thought is volitional, so that man has sovereignty over the operation of his mind, then he is a being of self-made soul. But is man such a sovereign? Is the mind volitional? Is free will true? And what exactly is its nature? And how do we know all this? That requires a separate discussion under the appropriate lectures in epistemology. Again, you see on this topic, as on all the others, a metaphysical view of man's nature, whether it's the objectivist view or any other, requires a deeper philosophic validation. Whether we say man survives by reason, or thinks as an individual, or as an integrated entity of mind and body, or feels as a result of what he thinks, or as a self-made, self-directed, efficacious being, all of it rests on an implicit foundation, on a definite metaphysics and epistemology, which is why Ayn Rand's view of man's nature is unique. It is unique because her basic philosophy is unique. Men have not seen man the way objectivism sees him, because thinkers have not held the fundamental premises of objectivism, but usually they're opposites. Which brings us to the final topic this evening, the role of philosophy in human life, which I've been stressing all night. Philosophy is the shaper of man's values. Philosophy, and especially its most important branch, epistemology, is the power which explicitly or implicitly guides man in the use of his conceptual faculty. From just these two points alone, you can see that if man is a being of self-made soul, then philosophy is the ultimate shaper of his soul. It's the element in every man which in fundamental terms makes him the kind of man he is. The fact is, philosophy is inescapable in human life. If you say, I don't care about a view of man or my soul, 
Let it be whatever it happens to be. I don't care about philosophic issues. I abstain entirely. Just leave me alone. You can say it, but you cannot literally live it. You cannot because man, by his nature, cannot exist without some kind of philosophy. And here I would like to quote several very eloquent paragraphs from Ms. Rand's West Point speech, which I strongly recommend that you read prior to next time for a magnificent statement of the role and need of philosophy in man's life. It is in the December issues, December 1973 of the Ayn Rand letter, and I've taken just an excerpt to capture the essence of the point for our purposes. Quote, without abstract ideas, you would not be able to deal with concrete, particular, real life problems. You would be in the position of a newborn infant to whom every object is a unique, unprecedented phenomenon. The difference between his mental state and yours lies in the number of conceptual integrations your mind has performed. You have no choice about the necessity to integrate your observations, your experience, your knowledge into abstract ideas, i.e. into principles. Your only choice is whether these principles are true or false, whether they represent your conscious rational convictions or a grab bag of notions snatched at random whose sources, validity, context, and consequences you do not know, notions which, more often than not, you would drop like a hot potato if you knew. But the principles you accept, consciously or subconsciously, may clash with or contradict one another. They, too, have to be integrated. What integrates them? Philosophy. A philosophic system is an integrated view of existence. As a human being, you have no choice about the fact that you need a philosophy. Your only choice is whether you define your philosophy by a conscious, rational, disciplined process of thought and scrupulously logical deliberation, or let your subconscious accumulate a junk heap of unwarranted conclusions, false generalizations, undefined contradictions, undigested slogans, unidentified wishes, doubts, and fears, thrown together by chance, but integrated by your subconscious into a kind of mongrel philosophy and fused into a single solid weight, self-doubt, like a ball and chain in the place where your mind's wings should have grown." Unquote. Philosophy, in sum, is a need of man's metaphysical nature. It is a need just as real and just as inescapable to man as the need of food, because it is a fundamental need of man's mind, without which, in the last analysis, he cannot obtain his food or anything else his life requires. In regard to food, you have to ingest something or die. And your choices are only life-promoting nourishment or dirt or poison. The same is true of philosophy. You have to take in something. And your choices are the same, which is why objectivism takes philosophy seriously. It does so because, in the last analysis, philosophy determines everything else about man's life, their actions, their science, their culture, their history, their triumphs, their disasters, their future. To take philosophy seriously, however, means, among other things, one crucial condition. <clears throat> and here I pick up the point that I promised at the beginning I would elaborate at the end. It means reaching philosophic, conclu philosophic conclusions by your own independent, rational judgment, i.e., you must really see and understand firsthand the truth of the ideas you accept. There are various areas of human endeavor where, under certain circumstances, it's practical to accept the advice of an expert and declare, he knows best, this is not my field. But you cannot do it in philosophy. And this is so even if you found a certified, completely rational expert. It would be useless, for instance, to turn even to such an expert and say to him, I need a philosophy. You're an expert, so I'm asking you. 
Should I, for instance, be selfish? Just tell me yes or no so I can act. I haven't time for discussion and proofs. Just give me the answer. Now, that expert could say, well, that's easy. Yes, be selfish, and then leave the room. But would that do you any good? After all, he told you the truth. But what else would you need? Well, now, just in pattern, as a taste of what would be involved, and just on this one example. You need to know what selfishness is. That would be very helpful. And how do you apply such a wide abstraction in particular real life situations? And if you should be selfish, does that mean do whatever you feel? And if so, what do you do if your feelings are irrational and clash with other people? And how do you know what's rational anyway? And who can say how a man should live? Maybe what's true for the expert isn't true for you. Or is truth objective? Well, what is truth? And what is objectivity? And what's the use? <laughs> How do you know if you can achieve your goals in this kind of world? So is there any point to being selfish? Well, what kind of world is it anyway? And if everyone was selfish, wouldn't that mean cutthroat competition and dog-eat-dog -dog and child labor? And how do you know the answer to all these questions? By what method of knowledge? Etc. Now that's just a taste, a sample of the pattern, but the point is you need to know it all, the whole system, and to know it not on faith. Faith doesn't work. It's useless. Even if what you have faith in happens to be true, you need to know it all firsthand with objective proof of each point on strictly practical grounds to make use of it, to function, to live. So if you truly wanted to be practical, realistic, hard-headed, you would therefore decide at some point, I've got to learn the subject. I've got to start from scratch and move systematically in the right order, in essential terms, with the right connections, with the proof of each point as I proceed. And of course, if you started from scratch in this manner, your first question would have to be, where do you begin? And how do you know that's the right starting point? How do you validate basic philosophic axioms? And what do such axioms tell you about the nature of reality? Now, ladies and gentlemen, these practical, hard-headed questions are the ones with which this course begins its systematic study of objectivism next week. Thank you. <laughs>
I'd also like to recommend just before we start that for next time, I'm of course assuming that you will have read Atlas Shrugged in the Fountainhead, and I'll say some more next time about reading. But specifically, beyond the obvious things, I would suggest you re read uh, in preparation for the discussion of metaphysics an article by Ms. Rand called The Metaphysical and the Man-Made, which is in the Ayn Rand letter in March 1973, because we will be referring to that. Now, qu first question. <clears throat> if identification and evaluation occur automatically and subconsciously in reacting emotionally to a perception, how do you know this is so? Uh, this is a question which uh, I believe so this comes from a modern epistemology, and the implication is you don't observe these processes, so they're non-empirical, and how do you know they exist? To begin with, the fact that some processes occur automatically uh, does not mean that they are not uh, obs observable. Uh, you can in a great many cases, and if you are rational, you ultimately can in all cases identify what are the premises you hold, the conceptual framework you accept and the value judgments you hold, you can actually make those conscious so that the lightning-like process, of course, will be too fast for you perhaps to identify in the moment of its occurrence, but you can retroactively introspect and actually observe that you hold those premises and that they are the ones at work. There is nothing in the fact that a premise acts instantaneously to prevent you from subsequently identifying and perceiving it, subsequently or in advance, knowing that you hold it. So that you cannot assume that uh, the automatic is the non-observable. I'll pass further comment on that. Can I re-explain what is the center of philosophy? All I mean by the center here is the topic which comes in the middle. And I mean it in that, I don't know how to say it beyond the way I did. There are certain foundation branches, a view of reality and of how man acquires knowledge. On that basis, you then reach a view of man's nature, of what his essential attributes are, of his means of survival, his essential relation to other men, the relation of his mind and his body, his reason and emotions, does he have free will? The kinds of questions we mentioned and took up this evening. That's then the center, and that's your, in the sense that it's the cashing in of your foundation, metaphysics and epistemology. And it, in turn, makes possible an answer to such questions as, how should a man live? What is right or wrong for him? That's ethics. How should he organize government and society? What are the proper functions? That's politics, and uh, what, by what standard should art be created and judged, that's aesthetics. So you can actually think of it as that skyscraper. The first half is the foundation, then in the middle comes the nature of man, and then the top, the blossoming out, to switch the metaphor, is the value or practical branches of philosophy. Are there not many complex creative ideas which are integrated subconsciously and seem to spring full-grown into conscious awareness. Emotions are not the only automatic responses, are they? No, of course not. There are other forms of automatic responses on automatic functioning other than emotions. Nothing that I said should be interpreted to mean that emotions exhaust the automatic aspects of consciousness. Uh, but uh, they are one such aspect, and they're very vital to understand man's metaphysical uh, nature. Um, you observed in an earlier course that the philosophic errors of the early Greeks were innocent. I interrupt to say that, uh, to begin with, in presenting the history of philosophy, I separate the presentation of the ideas from a moral evaluation of the character of those philosophers. This is, part, this is true in general. You must not commit ad hominem and confuse attacking a philosopher's character, however odious it is, with uh, the content of his views. But this is particularly applicable to the early Greeks, where uh, we have only fragments and very little is known, either about what they held or in general by mankind, and it's very, very difficult, therefore, to pass any 
moral estimate on the early Greeks. If you know four sentences from a man like Thales, for instance, I defy you to, to pass a, an estimate of what was in his mind when he wrote them, except you can give a positive estimate in the sense that he was a, his was a great achievement within the scope of the knowledge known. But we can only go by the knowledge that uh, uh, is available of what they were able to do. In that sense, I would incline to a very generous view of the early Greeks uh, as being, I'd rather pronounce them innocent than otherwise, simply because of the lack of knowledge of the case. But then the, that was to correct that statement. Then the questioner goes on, does this pardon apply to Plato's theory of emotions? Now, we do not give pardons. <laughs> And I am not going to analyze Plato's character here. I think Plato was, in many respects, a profoundly intelligent, not to say genius, uh, in the issues he rose. And in other respects, I cannot believe in any state of knowledge. However ignorant, you could believe some of the things that he put forth simply through an error of knowledge. Particularly not if the conclusion you come to is that your profession should be given dictatorial power over the rest of the world, whose inferiority consists of taking this world seriously. <laughs> so uh, I do not, if, if you use the term, extend that kind of pardon to Plato on that question, but I'm not in the business of excusing or uh, pardoning Plato for his theories. Uh, babies will cry if dropped suddenly. <laughs> There's a different question. Uh, apparently expressing fear. What would be the cognitive aspect of this emotion in a baby too young to know of any real danger of falling? This is a good question, and it raises the broader issue of emotions are what you could call the equivalent of emotions in babies and also the same thing in animals. And you wouldn't have to give just the example of falling. You could just as well give the example, for instance, of babies fearing the dark, and then the mother arrives and utters some words, and the baby feels pleasure and reassurance, etc. Now, in those cases, we would have to say that there is, in effect, a grasp of the situation and an evaluation on some sensory or perceptual level terms. If you're hypothesizing now a state prior to concepts, if you're talking about babies, or animals who don't have it, then they have such a thing as a perceptual observation in which they can tell they are in some sense out of control. That's how we, using conscious conceptual terms, would describe it. And all they know is some kind of sensation of helplessness. And uh, uh, in some sense, they know that this is undesirable, although they don't have the the concept undesirable. They can't, in other words, conceptualize the state. They can simply grasp, as an animal can on a perceptual level, that something here is threatening. And all we can do as, as adult human beings is say, this is what their knowledge would consist of if they could conceptualize it. But in actual fact, it exists simply in perceptual form and generates, therefore, what you could call the equivalent of an emotion. Why does the belief in God <coughs> create a view of man which necessarily implies a mind-body dichotomy? Well, it depends whether you take the belief in God seriously and as a developed philosophic viewpoint. But if you do, in that sense, a belief in God does necessitate a mind-body dichotomy of the following kind and in the following way. God represents a supernatural <coughs> spiritual dimension. Now, of course, you understand the point from Alice in Wonderland that you could, if you use words however you want, you can make anything true by the way you use words, but then you're not speaking language. But in other words, if you use God to mean a package of cigarettes, then God is not a spiritual being. But we are assuming that you use the term God here to designate the traditional uh, infinite father, creator of the world, omniscient, omnipotent, up in heaven, etc. Now. That is supposed to be a spiritual, non-material entity which transcends this world and which is opposite to this low, imperfect, physical dimension. Now, right off the bat there, you have then got the foundation of 
a spiritual material dichotomy. God is the good and he is the spiritual. Matter is the imperfect and the physical. And so you have the Platonic Christian antithesis. Now within that framework, it is simply consistency to go on and say man has two aspects. One pertains to God, and, then, and his goal therefore should be to escape the toils of the wicked body and go home. That is what the uh, 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 whole philosophic tradition that took the belief in God seriously has uh, held from Pythagoras and Plato on up, and you see the logic to it. Now here's a question I want to answer briefly. It has many parts, but I am going to just excerpt the part. If man's state of mind is a fact of reality, should one man, in being rational, take into account that other men behave irrationally? Do you get that? If man's state of mind is a fact of reality, should a rational man take into account that other men behave irrationally? The reasoning presumably being, well, since they behave irrationally, that's a fact, and you have to take facts into account. So shouldn't you therefore take into account that other men behave irrationally? And then he goes on, if yes, does taking others' irrationality into account in determining one's own action contaminate one's own rationality? Now, the answer is, you have to take every fact that you deal with into account. If it's a fact, you must take it into account. But what do you mean by take it into account? All that that tells you so far is identify the fact and act accordingly by the guidance of a rational code of values. So before you could know how to act, you would have to know what is the fact and what is the rational code of values. What advice does it give me in regard to this fact? Now, certainly too, if other men behave irrationally, you have to identify that fact. If you simply walked around and said, everybody is perfectly rational, I just don't recognize the fact, regardless of what they are from Jimmy Carter to Mao Tse Tung and back, they're all perfectly rational. You obviously are out of contact with reality completely. <laughs> so you have to recognize the fact. But then when you think, when the questioner says, wouldn't this contaminate his irrationality if he recognizes it and takes it into account, what does it mean to take it into account? There are two ways of taking into account other people's irrationality, to put it briefly. The method of Keating and the method of Rourke. Now, they both take it into account. Rourke is fully cognizant of the fact that people like Ellsworth Toohey and uh, Peter Keating exist. He takes it into account. He does not attempt to get commissions from, Ke uh, from Keating and Toohey. Uh, he has his own course. He recognizes what he's dealing with. He has certain principles, and he achieves them. Keating takes it into account in a quite different way. He decides that the irrational people rule the world, and therefore taking it into account means abandoning one's own convictions, stopping being rational oneself, and trying to beat them to the punch and be as irrational as they are so they'll accept you on their terms. In that sense, you certainly contaminate your irrationality, your rationality, but you wreck yourself altogether. Now, a full discussion of this really is the question what do you do when you have to deal with people who are no good? Uh, and that we, <coughs> we are going to discuss under ethics. But you must not equivocate and speak as though um, taking something into account tells you what to do when you've taken it into account. That leaves open how to act, by what code, etc. cetera. Uh, you stated that Aristotle's philosophy supports the mind-body split. If so, briefly support this, please. OK. First of all, Aristotle is as good as you can be on this question without being entirely correct. So I apologize to him if I left any implication that he was like Plato. Uh, he is far, far from being a, uh, an extreme advocate of the mind-body split. On the contrary, he's one of the best that there is. 
I meant, and in fact, I believe I could look it up. I said, literally speaking, he was not fully consistent on this point, and that he was not, as is evidence, for instance, to give you just two points out of metaphysics, his point that there is a prime mover, which is an entirely spiritual being existing without any body or any connection to the physical. Now that is the spirit separated from the physical. If he held the absolute premise of the integration of the spiritual and the physical, he could not advocate a pure spirit, as he does in the case of the prime mover. Now, true, I add immediately, I, I agree with all those people who are eager to tell me at this point that that's a platonic survival in him. Absolutely, it is a platonic survival in him. But then all of this bad element in him is a platonic survival. Uh, so if you want me to correct it, Aristotle qua Platonist has remnants uh, as, uh, of the mind-body split. The other one I was thinking of is uh, in his Ethics, where he tells us that the highest value in life is contemplation as an end in itself, not for the sake of practical guidance or uh, the achieving of material values. He's in favor of that. But nevertheless, the idea that you should emulate God and uh, pursue truth simply for the pleasure of contemplating it has definite platonic overtones and definite implication that the uh, spiritual is an end in itself severed from the material. It's in those ways, not in his major intention, but in that kind of carryover from Plato that Aristotle was not so uh, fully uh, consistent. Give me one second to look and see if I can find something brief in conclusion. They're, they're too long to read. Well, this one I can read. All right, I'll take two more, which are not exactly within the confines of what I call relevant, but they're brief. <laughs> <laughs> Define solipsism and place it within the con context of the main subject of tonight's lecture. <laughs> That's what you should have done asking the question. <coughs> Solipsism is the view that I myself alone exist. I, my consciousness alone exists. It comes from solus alone and ipsum myself. So it's myself aloneism, literally. And it is a reductio ad absurdum of idealism. First, the philosopher starts by denying that there's any matter at all. And he'll take a position like Bishop Berkeley, for instance, that there's only a whole bunch of minds and God's mind holding various kinds of relationships to each other, but no matter. And then the next step is someone asks him, how do you know there are other minds? Because when you look out and see those bodies, those are just experiences in your mind, according to your philosophy. There's no matter. So everybody else's bodies become experience in Barclay's mind. And it ends up that he doesn't know that anything exists but his own mind. And then you get the philosophy of solipsism. So it's like a dead end of idealism. Uh, to anticipate next week, it's the extreme version of the primacy of consciousness. It's not only the primacy of consciousness, it's there's no other thing but my consciousness. Uh, so it's out of the question as a uh, tenable or discussable view. Who would you discuss it with? Uh, <clears throat> with regard to placing it in the context of this lecture, there is no man if this is true. So there is no such question as man's metaphysical nature. There's no truth. There's no reality. There's no logic. There's no philosophy. And there surely is no lecture. So. <laughs> Now, this one I'm going to answer as an end, simply because it's fantastic. Is the issue of the moral propriety of abortion, the propriety of abortion, solved by observing that no one, not even a child, is entitled to sustenance by another, even its parent? Now, I'm not sure I understand the grammar of this, but if I get it, if I get it, this person is saying abortion is good or is all right. 
because a child does, has no right to be fed by his parents. That's what it seems to me. If so, this is not a statement of the objectivist viewpoint. <laughs> when you bear a child, if you bear a child, and he is born and is a living human being, you are certainly morally responsible for his sustenance. It's your choice that brought him into existence. You perform the act, which is very easy to know what its potential consequences are. You knew that this was a possibility. If you did not choose to abort the child, and he is now in existence, he is a human being, and he has the rights of a human being, and he is entirely your responsibility until he reaches the age of maturity and can support himself. You, it is not a principle of objectivism that no one, not even a child, is entitled to sustenance by another, even its parent, unquote. That is completely false. If you bring the child into existence, he jolly well is entitled to <laughs> sustenance on, on uh, the part of his parents. The moral propriety of abortion lies in the fact that it is not a human being that you are talking about. It is simply a potential human being. It is cells, it is tissue, which one day, if allowed to grow and develop, would become a human being, but it is not yet a human being. And consequently, it has no rights, and it places no duty and no obligations on the potential mother, certainly not the obligation that, counter to her wishes, she sacrifice her entire life and become a slave for decades thereafter to an unchosen obligation in the name of the rights of a non-existent, which is merely a potential. Abortion is justified because you are not dealing with a human being. It does not mean when you are dealing with a human being, with a child who is a real human being and no longer just a potentiality, then yes, you are morally obligated to support the child that you chose to bring into existence. On that note, we will conclude until next time. Thank you.